Hello, and welcome to the Medical College of Wisconsin's Coffee Conversations with Scientists. I'm your host, Raina Andrews, and for those of you tuning in for the first time, let me introduce myself. I'm a mother, a children's book author, a public health advocate, and engaged community member. I am your host for the 2023 Coffee Conversations with Scientists series. You know, Coffee Conversations is brought to you by the Advancing Healthier Wisconsin Endowment, which is a statewide nonprofit really working to improve health and advance health equity in Wisconsin. Since early 2021, we have been sharing the science behind today's most important health topics. So due to the global trend of growing sweetener consumption, Today, we're talking about how sweet it is to eat sugar or not to eat sugar. That is the question. And I'm really excited because there's a lot of misnomers out there about, should I consume um, sweeteners? Should I consume natural sugar? Eat this, more of that, in moderation. And so today's guest will really help us demystify those things. And so to tee it up, due to the global trend of growing sweetener consumption, determining the interplay between sweeteners and pre- and postnatal development is emerging as a critical area for research. Today, I'm joined with Dr. Stephanie Olivier von Steichlin, <laughs> Steichlin um, Assistant Professor in Biochemistry, Secondary Faculty in Obstetrics, Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Medical College of Wisconsin. And today we're going to discuss the really intersectionality of sweeteners, pregnancy development, and metabolism. Welcome, Dr. Olivier von Stichelin. Thank you, Raina. Uh, it's so great sorry. to be here. <laughs> yes, you will give me a, a lesson on how to pronounce, pronounce French names. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. Well, we'll be covering uh, a great list of questions regarding the intersections of sweeteners on our metabolism and reproductive health. And I encourage all of you out there on the interwebs watching to really drop any comments you have on the topic into the comments. We will be getting to as many questions as possible towards the end. Okay, so let's get started. So I think we just need an overview on sweeteners. So can you provide an overview on what artificial sweeteners really are and how they are used in food products and the various types commonly commonly available in the marketplace just to just to set the foundation for us? Absolutely. So um, so first, um, there is, as we know, not normal like sweeteners that are uh, sweet, but as uh, caloric as well. So those are our regular sugar. Um, the, the actual name of those are sucrose. This is uh, what we found in uh, sugar, table sugar, for example. This is what we found in uh, normal um, uh, sodas, for example, and a lot of cookies, candies, pastries, all of those. So that's our normal sugar um, consumption that we know. Now, um, uh, on the market now, and, and as many of you know, we have artificial sweeteners and natural non-caloric sweeteners. So artificial sweeteners are man-made. Um, uh, versus natural um, non-caloric sweeteners are actually found naturally in plants. So for example, the stevia that many of, uh, of, the, of people know, usually it comes from the stevia plant. Now, both of those uh, are low or no caloric sweeteners. So it means like they don't give us um, any calorie input from it. And that's really the major difference between those and our regular sugar. Um, artificial sweeteners um, are called by many different brand and names. So aspartame uh, would be e the equivalent of equal, um, pack, sugar pack, sweetener pack, uh, saccharine is sweet and low, sucralose is Splenda, and then acetophan potassium is often found in combination with sucralose, for example, in all of those diet products. Um, they're often labeled as- I'm sorry, um, as Steph, um, Dr. Yeah. Ben, how do you, like, what is this acetophane, what is that? Precise. Acetylfame potassium. So that's one of the artificial sweeteners on the market. And um, it's just not as known. Uh, it doesn't have a, a brand on its own. So we don't find those little pack, for example, but on its own, it's always combined with something else and often combined with sucralose. So that's why we don't know it as much. But if you look, if you take any um, diet sodas, uh, often you'll see in the list of products, in the list of um, um, chemical um, sucralose and acetophan potassium uh, combined. And the reason we don't find this one alone is actually sweet and a little bitter, bitter as well. And so they usually don't combine it on its own because it gives too much bitterness. Um, 
So, so yeah, so artificial sweeteners are found in a lot of different products that I've uh, shown here, um, including some stuff that people don't really think about, um, like uh, lipsticks or um, uh, ad uh, additive to water, like this, like little powder you put in water to give a uh, little taste, uh, but also like some uh, cold medicine when it's say sugar free, usually had some kind of sweeteners, particularly if you taste the sweet out of it. Um, but uh, toothpaste, um, toothpaste for kids have some sweeteners in them uh, sometimes. And then uh, PDLI, for example, is another brand that um, when it says zero sugar have sweeteners. Um, so the natural sweeteners are um, the same overall concept means they don't give us scattery uh, from it, but then they are fine in natural, uh, uh, natural like plant. Um, so like stevia for here, but also monk fruit in, is another um, most common one now. Um, and you would find those in also a lot of uh, different brands, including those little packs that you can put in your um, sugar, like uh, in your coffee, sorry. So like sweet uh, stevia in the raw is one. Uh, but also yogurt, um, even bread sometimes, water drops, etc. Wow. So, <clears throat> Dr. Olivier von Stichlin, when you see the 200x, the 300x, 600x, what does that mean? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so that is called the uh, sweetness power. Um, and so, if we see, if we um, think that one uh, normal sugar, so one sucrose is one x, uh, so it, it has like a, a power, a sweet power of one the aspartame in comparison will have 200 times the sweetness of a sucrose or a saccharin will have 300 times, 600 times, et cetera. And um, that's what also makes them really attractive to uh, be in product because we need a lot less artificial sweeteners than we need sugar to have the same sweetness at the end. You know, this is, this is really good. Thank you for breaking this down because it makes me think, what is the current science really, <laughs> what does the evidence tell us about the effects of sweeteners on our metabolism? And if you can also say, are there any differences in how different types of sugars are metabolized in the body? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've, I've put together this little slide and what we can see here is that um, there's commonality and there's also something that sweeteners, uh, artificial sweeteners or non nutritive sweeteners don't do. So one of the things they do really well to uh, both regular sugar as well as sweeteners is they bind a sweet taste receptor. And so that's why we found them sweet. Um, sweet receptor are in our mouth, but also, and people don't usually know about this, we have sweet receptor all over our body, uh, including in our brain, in our lungs, in our intestine, um, in adipose tissue, et cetera. And so wherever there is a sweet receptor, uh, sweet taste receptor, uh, both uh, sweeteners and sugar will bind this and signal something to the body. So it can signal your brain that it tastes sweet and it's nice, right? Um, it could also t uh, signal your intestine that um, there's nutrient coming, like sh normal sugar, and we need to absorb those nutrients to be able to gain energy from it. And a difference, major difference between sweeteners, artificial sweeteners, or natural non-caloric sweeteners, so stevia, and sugar, is that they do not uh, give us a uh, calorie or really little compared to sugar that um, the, mo the most thing that um, sugar does is that it gets absorbed by our cells and then eventually leads to energy. So we get energy from it um, uh, to be able to run, to even function and our brain also needs a lot of energy to think. Um, but it also uh, leads to storage. So either uh, glycogen storage to uh, use for later energy or even fat storage for long-term storage of, uh, of, um, of uh, sugar. Uh, and then also a direct modification of our um, uh, protein, which are a functional part of our body. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is something that everyone should know, but I'm so glad that she went over it because a lot of us are out of touch with the fundamentals. And I think that the beauty of this show is that we really demystify a lot of things that people are assuming. Just moving on to the next question, we can probably take this slide down is thinking about a lot of people consume diet beverages or diet foods as a way to lose weight, as if it really reduces your caloric intake. Does diet or artificial sweeteners really promote weight management? So, so I, um, I, I'll reiterate, that's what has been um, said for many, many years is that switching to artificial sweeteners and particularly because we just saw that slide before, you can imagine that we are not expecting sweeteners to go through that metabolism and be stored as fat and as uh, uh, glycogen storage. And so, therefore, you should not put on as much weight. Um, this is actually 
even though on paper it looks really what what that would be it is actually not true so if we look at many studies that people have done over the years it, they notice a short time uh, on a short time period so let's say a couple of months you would you will lose weight and you will uh, be able to drop a little bit because you're likely switching from something that was a really heavy sweet diet, uh, sugar diet to something that has no sugar anymore. But on long-term diet, uh, it actually is not true. So people usually don't lose weight over time, um, over a period I'm thinking, or like maintaining of weight loss. Uh, you, don't man you don't maintain that weight loss. Uh, long-term, uh, people actually in, on long-term even sometimes gain weight depending on the study. So this is not actually true. Another fact, for example, that's interesting is if you, uh, there was a, this really interesting study where um, uh, adolescent will give us uh, sweeteners and also uh, ability to have uh, normal sugar drinks and they actually drink even more of the regular uh, that the regular sodas for example if they also had some uh, artificial sweetener soda on top of it so their consumption even was higher of regular sugar drink than it was uh, if they didn't have artificial sweeteners drink on the side so mm -hmm. so long story short it does not after years of uh of um, uh, study, uh, we don't really have a really solid proof that it does uh, help with weight management. Mm. You know, this is interesting because for years I've seen people drinking Diet Coke thinking that, oh, you know, I'm just managing my, my, my weight. This, you know, this isn't as bad as regular Coke. And I guess it sounds like you just really shouldn't drink it at all because sometimes drinking these diet beverages could create cravings in other places for that real natural sugar. Yeah, so one of the things that we know is actually the the body gets used to also not having um, uh, normal sugar come in. So mm -hmm. like, uh, let's say you will drink art, uh, artificial sweeteners, so diet sodas for a long time. And then at some point, um, it, it, you know, it, it understand that even though it's sweet, it tastes sweet, it actually doesn't have anything in it. I cannot metabolize, I cannot make energy. And so you kind of dim your response to regular sweet and you might not absorb it as much or you might have absorbed even more, but it kind of like, trick your body in a sense that it doesn't have the normal response to it. So all, all together, it has, it has um, work as a tool management, particularly for uh, diabetic people, for example, that we need to stop consuming sugar. As far as weight loss per se, I don't think that's a, um, that's been proof over the year that is not really long-term a good weight management uh, solution. And, and on top of this, the, double, uh, the WHO in May, of uh of this year actually put out a uh, an announcement saying that it do, they do not advise artificial sweeteners consumption for weight loss anymore so that's been um kind of the story around this that's good to know for our audience you know dr von stichlin um back in may we spoke with dr anna palatnik um specifically about um preeclampsia and this is high risk maternal health and um, we talked about weight management. And I'm curious, do artificial, artificial sweeteners consumed by pregnant mothers, does it cross the placenta and directly affect the developing baby? Or like what, ev ev what evidence exists regarding the presence and metabolism of these sweeteners in the actual fetus? Yeah, so so long story short, yes, they do. Um, so everything that a mother uh, more or less uh, drink or eat will eventually reach out the placenta and sometimes uh, some um, a product or uh, a nutrient will cross really well and artificial sweeteners actually do. So they will cross the placenta. It's, it's been found in amniotic fluid. It's been found in cord blood. It's been found in the in fetal, uh, in newborn, for example, um, really early on. So we know it actually crosses Another thing that's interesting is it it will not be the same rate for each of the sweeteners. So sweeteners do not have exactly the same, um, let's say, penetration in the body, if you want. Um, so, for example, sucralose is really good at staying in the gut, uh, and it will stay it most of the time. It will stay in the gut. But uh, as is potassium, we talked at the beginning, the less known of the four I put in there. Uh, actually crosses really well. And so it will enter our body and it will get mostly in our bloodstream rather than stay in the gut. So for example, you think about the placenta, this is where the it's a, a bloody basically barrier between the fetal compartment and the mother. This is this will be based in artificial sweeteners, particularly in uh, acetophan potassium, for example. So how does um, that, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. How does that affect the baby's health? Yeah, so so first we there was there was a couple of study on mother's health, and we we don't actually have 
um, a lot of uh, in, in information. Let's say a mother would start drinking diet soda during pregnancy, have never done it before. Um, it is a pretty short period of time. And, and as, as basic scientists, we do a lot of mouse study. And, and so we do short pregnancy study like this. And we do not see a dramatic change in the mothers per se, but we do see a lot of change in the uh, offspring, for example, in mice or um, uh, over in, in some cohort in human. What we've noticed is that there is uh, some changes, particularly coming from my lab, we've noticed that there was change in microbiome really early on um, in, uh, in uh, babies. Um, so as you know, we're born mostly germ free, as we call, so our microbiome is pretty bare. And then we're, when we're born, uh, we are, uh, we start populating our, our biome like this. And so it comes from breast milk, it comes from uh, touching our mothers, it comes from uh, drinking more stuff. So we are getting this growing microbiome that helps us long term as well. And uh, disruption of the bio microbiome or dysbiosis of the microbiome does not help our health. Help our health, and that we know. Um, a microbiome drive obesity. Microbiome drive a lot of uh, problem in health. And so we know artificial sweeteners affect microbiome. That's been shown many, many time over. Uh, but when you think about a growing body, somebody like a, a baby that starts with a bare biome and we already are shooting artificial sweeteners on it, it affected that even more and from a really early stage. Um, we've also, uh, again, from our own study, but others, we've also noticed some uh, weight, uh, um, a lower uh, birth weight, for example, in mice uh, and rats also, from not from us, from another study, uh, as well as uh, lower glucose uh, at birth, uh, blood glucose at birth. So all of this uh, showing that there's something that Having artificial sweeteners on a developing metabolism, which is not, which kind of fragile at first, uh, is maybe a little bit worse in effect than what it would be on an adult uh, person. So to be clear, have studies shown any associations between artificial sweeteners, the intake during pregnancy, <clears throat> and an increased risk of preterm birth or any alterations in the baby's birth weight? So the, there is some uh, human, um, now we're talking about, we're going to talk about human because that's what most people uh, would rely on. And there was some um, association, right, between uh, human uh, birth weight and preterm birth and artificial sweeteners consumption. Now, this is to take with a big, big uh, um, caution because most of the human artificial sweetener study are underpowered. Um, and so we don't have enough um um, we don't have the number of uh, the cohort number of patient, for example, to be able to really um, um, nail it down to the point that, yes, this is dangerous or not. This is this is totally OK. And that's what most of the artificial sweeteners right now feel is about. It's like it's really hard in human, particularly to um, assess consumption of sweeteners in, in, in people in general. Um, most most person do not know like assessive and potassium, for example, you just talked about. Um, mm -hmm. And so how do you assess correctly people when they cannot identify artificial sweeteners on, on, on uh, food label, for example? We also have no clue how much they actually consume, uh, let, let's say in a, in a precise amount. Um, and that's part of, the, that. this is really because there's no um, uh, indication of how much is in each product on food label. So if you look at the label, there's always a list, right, of component. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, those components starts from the higher amount to the lower amount, but we don't actually have the amount. So we don't know how much acetone potassium or how much sucralose is in each of those products that I've listed that the, in the first uh, part of that um, interview. So how do you assess correctly the risk for disease when you don't have a starting point to say like, well, this is a, this, this is a really heavy consumer. This person actually consumes a lot. Um, so th this is kind of where um, going to a lower model, like mouse model, where we can manage, actually give them a precise amount of sweeteners and then measure um, uh, impact of, uh, on, on their health. It's actually a lot more manageable and it's a good starting point to figure out if there is some um, measure that needs to be taken in human. Wow. I, you know, I have a question about research and, um, and the studies and like how these things should be set up. But first, I want to talk about what's been a hot topic in the news is the new findings of artificial sweeteners causing cancer. Can you share um, kind of some of your knowledge on that and what you've learned? Yeah, exactly. So, so it was not, um, it's, it was in July, right? Um, like two weeks ago, I'd say now. Um, so WHO also released another, so in like a couple of months, we got two big WHO announcements. This one was uh, classifying aspartame as a potential carcinogenic uh, compound. 
Um, now, aspartame, we haven't talked too much about it. It's actually a little bit different than other artificial sweeteners. And the reason is because it's actually break down into other component, uh, other um, uh, molecule. Um, most of the artificial sweeteners, we, the other we talked about, are actually intact and, and will not change uh, their structure all across our body. Uh, aspartame isn't. It gets broken down into uh, various compounds. Um, the re the the WHO announcement is that um, there was a couple, there's three different studies that have shown association between aspartame consumers and a uh, risk of uh, liver cancer no, um, uh, in part. Now, again, take this with a lot of caution. First, the uh, WHO and the FDA have, uh, confirmed this after did not say it was it was cancer carcinogenous. It put it in that category because they assume they. Um, Said that we need just more research to be able to say it is or it is not. Uh, it has just been in that category for like a to watch list um, and suggesting that uh, people like us go to work and basically do the research so we can uh, have a little bit better understanding. Those three studies where there was a clear association, but again, there was underpower. And like I mentioned aspartame big breakdown. It's hard, for example, let's say we would do a blood draw to try to figure out how much those people do, uh, consume aspartame wise, we would not find aspartame, we would find those breakdown products. Um, those breakdown products can come from other sources, right? Methanol, for example, it's another, it's one of those breakdown products can come from other sources. Phenylalanine, it's an amino acid, it can come from other sources. So all of those makes the aspartame, um, studying aspartame metabolism really, really hard and also makes that that um, call from WHO, uh, this is why like we're just, we need more study. We need more basic science study powered enough so we can actually say it is potentially a carcinogenic compound or not. Mm -hmm. We have um, a couple questions from our audience, but I do want to have follow-up questions regarding future research where um, with maternal health, you said that, you know, a lot of evidence or more evidence has been captured with mice. I'm wondering what are what are the most pressing research gaps in this area of, you know, does artificial sweeteners cause cancer and um, what gaps may also exist and really determining the um, the connection or the relationship between various sweeteners and metabolic reproductive health. Yeah, that's a big, there's a lot of different gaps to fill, right? I think for the, it's clear that from the aspartame um, cancer relationship, um, the human, right now we have human association study. So now it needs to go back to, I think, lower organism like mice or rat study, where you will create um, um, models where you would feed um, a certain amount of aspartame and an exact amount, right? Something we know um, uh, we can put, for example, we can put this on little uh, treat for mice, for example, we know exactly how much they will get every day. And mm -hmm. then uh, and then try to see if it does really uh, lead to liver cancer or other cancer. Um, those study, I'm sure are on their way. We are not working on aspartame personally, but I'm sure they are on their way, knowing that the petition was filled for WHO to look at it already. Um, for other like reproductive uh, health, for example, this is what we are more interested in. And uh, right now we're actually looking at um, this placental crossing barrier. And so I think this is critical as the uh, baby and the fetus is really a developing body, it's really a different setting than, you know, feed, like drinking diet soda as an adult, where we're pretty steady as far as our metabolism. It takes a little bit to change us, right? Like get a type two diabetes takes years and years. So, but a developing body is something that's trying to make, you know, everything works correctly and put everything together. And it's, a, we, we're pretty complex, right? We need a lot of stuff to work, fu to function. And so like having, trying to disrupt that from the beginning might be just a lot. And so that's what we're trying to figure out is like how much actually crosses and is there interference between artificial sweeteners and other stuff as a developing body like this? So I think that's where we, we are trying to um, uh, fill that gap as much as possible and potentially make the guideline evolve in the future for uh, consumption during pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So more human engagement in these research moving from mice to actual people. And when people are asked to participate in these food questionnaires to be more obliged to participate. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that would be that would be awesome. Right? Yeah. Um, the 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 one of the big challenge we have with those though is like the evolution of the food industry is, is really, you know, it goes really fast. Exactly. So mm -hmm. new artificial sweeteners product comes in every day. So 
we to make a, an actual reliable questionnaire is really hard because it just changes all the time. Um, so we need to be on top and almost like have people go through the aisle of like supermarket to like not all the new product that comes out that are zero sugar or less sugar. Mm. So yeah. So now I think that's a great transition for us to turn over to our audience. Um, one of the questions from our audience member is they'd like to know your thoughts about stevia. Is it better because it's natural? So there's a lot less research on stevia. And I think that the reason for this is stevia has been consumed for uh, decades and decades, even like probably hundred years and some um, civilization, right? So I think the stevia, we don't, we have a lot more background and, and potentially if there was like some dramatic impact on health, we would probably have catch it by now mm -hmm. uh, compared to our sugar sweeteners, which are a lot more recent. So we're starting to see like kind of a long-term effect more now. So that's why like those studies are coming out now, not like 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So I would say stevia in a sense is more natural. Um, like, like we say, it comes from plants and, and um, overall, I would say just don't go all in on one, um, just like, you know, vary and like try to be as mindful on your body as like, you know, we, we're not used to having that much sweet is a, is a, something we, we get used to because we are surrounded by sweets all over us. And so having a little bit less sweet sweeteners or normal sweet is fine too. So that's helpful in moderation for sure, um, with whatever we consume, Another another audience member is asking, do you have any information on sugar alcohols such as xylitol? What are sugar alcohols? Yeah, so those are um, alcohol that um, are um, uh, th those are sugar alcohol. So they 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 have like this little um, uh, structure that makes them look like an alcohol, but they taste sweet um, and they they are sugary, and so they are, however, a lot less uh, sweet power than what we've talked about earlier. Um, so they do not taste as sweet as aspartame, for example, or, or, or the other, um, um, the other artificial sweeteners. And they're really using a really a few, a handful of product like gum usually are, have uh, sugar alcohol. Um, we are somehow metabolizing a little bit of it and we can mix some of them. So it's a little bit more natural than, um, they're not regulated as, as strictly, for example, as artificial sweeteners are because they're a little bit more, um, naturally made by us. Mm -hmm. This is a really interesting, the next question is really interesting, considering that we've talked about Wagovi and Ozempic. And so they're asking, what is the relationship between semaglutides, such as Wagovi and Ozempic, and insulin resistance relative to the various types of sugars that you've spoken about today? So, so for um, insulin resistance, the, there was really strong study that have shown that um, uh, you can uh, have uh, increased insulin resistance and increased blood sugar concentration from uh, consuming some sweeteners. So particularly saccharine and sucralose uh, have been the two uh, sweeteners that we've, um, we've talked about uh, in that study. And so, and in mice as well as in humans. So that was really interesting. Now, um, again, Somebody that's already diabetic uh, will have um, probably better off going with artificial sweeteners. That's one of the major uh, advice right now uh, um, in, in diabetic population. Uh, but again, um, sweet is a habit. So um, there's other options now uh, on the market that are uh, maybe not a little bit less artificial sweeteners, a little bit more natural um, um, flavor, for example, product that, that could, could be a good alternative. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely... As somebody who is, again, non-diabetic, um, healthy, there's evidence that that could actually increase your blood sugar concentration and not, not decrease it at all. Mm -hmm. um, in one of your, in the second column, I think with artificial um, sweeteners, you had Pedialyte. One of the audience questions is sports drinks. They're heavily yeah. promoted to young athletes. Can you speak to um, the sugar sweetener content of these and <clears throat> any dangers associated with overconsumption? So, yeah, so there's uh, a lot of sports drink and particularly because of athletes trying to manage their weight, don't want to put on like a ton, right? So they want, usually they want caffeine in those sports drinks. They want um, some additional minerals, uh, something that will boost a little bit their performance, but they don't really don't want the extra sugar if they can't avoid it. Um, and so that's why a lot of those now switch have been switched to low sugar or no sugar. And most of those will have sucralose and sulfan potassium as a combo, um, like we like most of the diet sodas. Um, I would say same same as everybody, um, same as every other adult. Uh, I would say those are again, um, if you consume um, so. 
one thing we didn't talk about is the um, acceptable daily intake. So the FDA put out uh, the amount of artificial sweetener we're supposed to consume a day. And so those have been uh, regulated and, and based mostly on, on um, um, rodent study and then eventually went on to, okay, this is the amount you should be consuming a day. Um, so and some of those amount are like, for example, nine diet coke per circles or something like this. So mm -hmm. that would be uh, if you don't if you don't go over this for reg for an um, healthy adult, it is considered safe. So mm -hmm. I would say again, don't know, do not overindulge, do not drink like um, a case of it every day, um, and then um, listen to your body if it doesn't feel okay, right? Yeah. And, and try some water, drink water try, and try water. <laughs> uh, the last question, I know we're almost, we're at time now, but the, the question is what is the difference between cane sugar and high fructose corn syrup? And should, should they both be avoided or should we avoid one or the other? <clears throat> no. So that, that's a really interesting. So the sugar, um, realm right from like regular table sugar like white sugar you have on tables versus high fructose corn syrup versus like uh, honey or even like brown sugar so the differences between all of this is the, pro is the amount of processing that's been done so raw sugar or brown sugar those are like or honey are good sugar because they have additional stuff in them so they we keep the molasses when they process the sugar so that's the brown Taste that when the processed sugar it makes so brown sugar keep have this inside still right and this it has mineral this has vitamins in there and so that's a good addition to your sugar the more you go into the high fructose corn syrup the more you go into natural normal sugar the more it gets to uh no vitamin no mineral and so this is just a less uh, uh less addition to your health, let's put it this way. And an high fructose corn syrup has a lot of fructose compared to glucose. And that's also like an imbalance for our regular diet. So stay away from the high fructose. If you have to choose one, choose the former. Yeah, I would say brown sugar is, a, is even better. Again, you have just additional vitamin. Vitamin are always good. They're used for a lot of stuff between neurotransmission, making your brain work to antioxidants, sometimes helping your liver detox. It's a lot of good. It's a lot of good. Vitamins are never bad. So um, I, would, I would rather go honey or brown sugar than even like white sugar or like high fructose corn syrup. When in doubt, try and go the most natural route. And so yep. with that, wow, I can't believe our time together went by so quickly. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Olivier von Stichlin. I really appreciate you joining us today. We appreciate you taking the time and to talk about this very important topic. So I know there was a lot of things that I didn't know prior to meeting you. So thank you. Well, th thank you so much for inviting me. That was great. Yes. And for all of you out there in the interwebs, if we didn't get to your question, I'm so sorry, but please feel free to send us a note at conversations at mcw.edu. And so I hope you all enjoyed this month's um, Coffee Conversations with Scientists, and we hope you'll join us next month. Have a good day.